Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, first session of the last slot of this Mordic conference. And I'm very happy to welcome on stage Jana Tori Aspaki. Uh, hey, Jana. Hey, uh, how are you? Yeah. Um, for those who don't know you, I know you are uh, really into email deliver deliverability, inboxing. <laughs> what <laughs> um, we're going to talk about to us uh, today. I'm, I'm sure you will tell us a lot about the personal and, and business background in your talk just a little bit. But I am always confused. Uh, you are based in Canada or you're based in the Netherlands? I am now based in the Netherlands. I moved to a beautiful town called Harlem. It's nice oh, here. <laughs> okay, well known, of course. Um, okay, you are the CRO of a company called Email Consul, uh, based in the Netherlands, plus other places, as far as, far as I understand. Um, but I also know that you are enthusiastic about sharing knowledge and learning yourself and all that. So I appreciate your time here. Um, I'm looking forward to this talk, but I'm sure there's going to be questions because uh, email inboxing is one of the top priority topics in every marketing community and martech community and so in Mordic as well. Um, so people out there, if you have any questions, um, we're very happy to, to, to add them, to, to uh, answer them at the end of the talk, maybe even in between if it's urgent. Please, please use the Q&A tab on the right hand side of, the, of your screen, there's a Q and A. Uh, there also is a chat that, that is more global, and you can use that for side notes. But with all questions, please collect them as they come up in the Q and A part. Not only at the end, whenever you have a question, please drop them right there. Huh? What else? Um, I guess that's it from my side. Uh, we have uh, not not quite an hour, but but enough time, I hope. So there you have it, Jana. Stage is yours. Thank you very much for being here. Perfect. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen, and let's hope this works uh, the moment I share. Of course. Ah, here we go. So welcome, everybody. Uh, today we're going to be talking about email and deliverability misconceptions. Uh, one thing that I have noticed uh, being in deliverability for so long is that most mistakes or most inboxing issues come from people who think they're doing the right thing because they don't really, really understand what it takes to actually send an email and make it land in the inbox. Uh, so a little bit about me. I just got a dog. I moved uh, from Canada to the Netherlands in the middle of the pandemic. And uh, I visited back and I decided I was going to bring a, a Canadian dog back with me. So hopefully she's cute enough for you to listen to everything I have to say until the end. Um, I've been a durability specialist for almost a decade. And um, I started my career at CakeMail. It's a Canadian ESP. Uh, they send emails and I learned everything uh, from working all those years there. Uh, when I left, I decided that it was time to help other people understand what it actually takes to send an email in the inbox and uh, to help kind of bust all the, the misconceptions that people have. At Email Console, me and my partners, we are working on deliverability monitoring tools. So we're here to tell you what Google thinks of you, what your sender reputation is, and of course, give you all the information that you require in order to ensure the emails are landing in the inbox. And it all starts with data and knowing how good of a sender you are. So let's get started. So we're going to start with the simplest question, uh, the difference between delivery and deliverability. Sometimes in email marketing tools, those two terms um, are exchanged, but they are not the actual, they're not the same thing. So when you're sending an email, the one of the most important things is that the other side, the subscriber can actually receive emails. If the email exists, of course they can receive emails. If um, their mailbox is full, of course, we're going to see a soft bounce, mailbox is full, the inbox exists, but cannot accept uh, the email, and so on, and all the other problems. So the delivery part is ensuring that the inbox can receive an email. If the um, inbox exists, an email can be delivered to the mailbox provider of your subscriber. If, for example, the mailbox is full, it cannot be delivered either because the inbox cannot accept it for your subscriber to see. 
Deliverability on the other point is what happens after the mailbox provider accepts an email. So do they decide to take accept the email and put it in the inbox, uh, one of the other tabs? Do they decide to put it in the junk or spam folder? Or do they decide to take the email and then not show it to anyone anywhere? That's where the deliverability part comes into play. And the only person who would have this kind of information is a subscriber and what happens on the mailbox provider side. Uh, an ESP um, from your own inbox, if you send emails, you can understand that an email has been delivered, but you will never know if it has gone into the inbox. So there's a lot of things that you need to take care of, and of course, to ensure that your emails are not only accepted by the mailbox writer, but they're actually shown to your subscribers. Because we have to be very honest with ourselves, even if we do the most amazing marketing in the world, if people don't see the message, I mean, we're wasting a lot of opportunities here. And uh, the biggest problem, I believe, is that we don't really know exactly who received the email in the inbox or not. Um, we might know a percentage, but we might not know exactly who. So we're losing the opportunity and control that we have when it comes to email, where we know who we're communicating with and who's getting what message. So we're going to start with the sender reputation, just so that it, um, all the other things we're going to talk about are going to make sense altogether. Uh, when it comes to sending emails, you have a sender reputation. Uh, it used to be based on IPs, it migrated towards um, the domain. We started you know, listening to block lists, engagement came into play. So the sender reputation, the easiest way to explain it would be comparing it to the American um, credit core system. If you pay your bills on time and you do, you know, you show to the banks and to everyone that you can pay things on time, that you know how to manage your money, you will have a bigger credit score. It will allow you to get a mortgage maybe easier, uh, reduce your interest rates, and so on. On the flip side, if you don't pay your bills on time, you're going to be impacted. It might not be catastrophic, but you might not be able to get bigger limits on your credit cards. You might not get the amount of the mortgage you're looking for. And the same thing happens with email. So you might be a very, very good sender. You're sending emails. People like them. And you don't change. So over the years, you do the same marketing again and again, and maybe your audience changes. So they don't engage anymore with the emails. They don't interact with it. The mailboxes are going to learn from this and they're going to start realizing, okay, maybe they're doing the right thing. They're emailing people with consent, but their emails are not becoming relevant anymore. They don't, people don't find them valuable and that is going to impact you. The sender reputation works mailbox per mailbox. So you might have a great reputation with Gmail because your Gmail subscribers, for example, are very engaged. And you might be hitting a lot of spam traps or bounces or spam complaints in the Microsoft side. So you might have issues with Microsoft. So just like you would with a credit score, we can understand how things are calculated, but we don't exactly know how many points we're winning or we're losing when we're paying our bills on time. Same thing with the sender reputation. One, we don't have all the data. So we have the data the ESPs can give us, but we don't have all the data when it comes to what Google thinks of us, and Microsoft, and all the other inboxes. And then we have to make decisions that are going to impact us. Either we know it or we don't. We might think our subject lines are great. We might think our content is nice. We might not know as well that people are reporting our emails as spam. This is information, unfortunately, that's not always given back uh, to the sender. So you think you're doing everything fine and small little red flags over time are going to affect you and the reputation that you have as a sender. So a good sender reputation is going to come by having by being able to show spam filters that you have a relationship with the people you're communicating with. Email is not like social media where we're like, hello, we exist. We're here to make people do something. Um, so ensure that everybody... Uh, sorry, everybody as in the mailbox providers understand that or else it's going to impact you way more than just, you know, spam complaints or, or buying lists. So we're going to talk today about what the spam filters are looking for. What are you doing that might make sense to you uh, as a business? And then on the side of the mailbox, they don't like it or vice versa. What are things that you think might be weird that the spam filters are looking for and won't penalize if they see on their end? So here's the quick list. There's seven things we're going to be going over today. So we have lists and consent, authentication, block lists, sender reputation, your content, the consistency, which is a broader topic than just being consistent, and engagement, of course. How does it work when it comes to email? So let's start with the first thing, uh, lists and consent. 
So one thing that the mailbox providers have done very well in the last couple of years is work on their spam filters. They're able to detect a lot more information um, from their actual users because we have to remember that our subscribers are Gmail's customers. Gmail is trying to make its customers happy, not my business happy when I send emails, right? So the mailboxes have now uh, worked on their technologies and they're able to look at a lot more things in order to make a decision. So one thing that they can figure out um, is if your growth is organic. Are you purchasing lists versus is your list growing because people want to receive your messages, they know who you are and they're expecting them. Um, the first example I can give you of how somebody can monitor this very quickly is they know Gmail, for example, the portion of your email that is Gmail. Uh, Gmail knows who you're sending emails to. So if over time, the people you're emailing are the same people all the time and engagement fluctuates, you know, different parts of the year, um, you're doing different things, marketing is different, Google is going to send that as normal. But if in the space of a year, you've sent one email to a million different people that don't engage, that don't accumulate at some point, it's just always trying and trying and trying uh, to get somebody's attention, the spam filter of Google is going to understand that this is not organic. You're shooting emails maybe to people who might be interested, but they don't know who you are. You don't have their consent. You don't have a relationship with them. And that is extremely important. We all agree on in social media that if people go and they buy the follows or the likes, you know, Instagram figures it out and can penalize an account. And we're okay with that. Unfortunately, we have to be okay with the inboxes doing the same thing. If you are just buying again and again and again and you don't have the relationship and the mailbox providers realize this, they are going to impact you. And they're going to start deciding who gets your email or not. The other thing that is very important is having protected forms. Uh, you need to make them easy. The more uh, I read a statistic, the more fields you ask, uh, you reduce the percentage by six to eight percent of people actually filling out the form. So it's very important that one, it is quick. Two, you're able to prove what value signing up to your email is going to bring because it's going to show the way they interact with the emails in the future. And of course, to ensure they're protected. You have no idea how many companies or their forms are abused and not by millions of emails in an evening, just a couple of fake emails every now and then uh, throughout time just to impact you because those fake emails will impact your sender reputation. Then of course, buying lists, uh, no matter what list cleaning tool you're using, spam traps are always going to be there. There's no way of getting rid of them. There are millions of spam trap emails being created on a weekly, monthly basis no one can catch up and know who they are. So it's very important to reduce those things. And if ever anybody, uh, a block list or a mailbox provider tells you you're hitting spam traps, to do a list cleaning, a very, a very, very strict one that will remove anybody who hasn't uh, interacted with your emails. Spam traps are, it's in the name, they're traps to find people who are inbox or sending emails to people who have never signed up. These are just email addresses that have inboxes that exist, but no human behind them. There is no way this person would have ever signed up to your emails. Then, of course, is the inbox engagement. Depending on the relationship you have with the customers, the engagement uh, that the mailbox provider is going to see in the inbox from your emails is going to be totally different. Also, logic play, it plays into this. I always use this example. If you're a mattress store and I bought a mattress, sending me another email about a mattress is definitely not going to make me buy another mattress. So the engagement I have is based on the relationship we have and the type of business you are in. So sometimes it's important to be able to target specific customers using specific data so that you don't reduce your own inbox engagement by sending the same message to everyone. Then list cleaning, super important. If you're emailing people who don't like your emails, Google knows a lot more than you do. It is important to remove them or to resegment people, put them on the side. And of course, even if you're legally allowed to buy lists or to communicate with businesses or customers uh, without their consent first, unfortunately, the spam filters don't care. Uh, there's, Google has a spam filter. Everybody has to follow the Google, lo um, not laws, but the Google rules. Even if you're allowed to buy the list, you will be penalized. Um, so it's important to understand that. Um, 
Then authentication, this is extremely important. This is something Mate can help you with, of course. Uh, their customer support team is definitely going to do that for you and uh, give you any advice you need. Authentication just proves that you're the sender. It's like going to the bank and uh, trying to take money out. If I don't have any ID, the bank might not let me take the money out, even if the person knows me personally and I have a great relationship with the bank. And as time progresses, authentication is going to be enforced. Mailbox providers are going to have to look at the authentication in order to accept an email or not. Um, so even if you don't know what it is and you don't know what I'm talking about, a screenshot of this, send it to your email marketing uh, uh, software support team and they will definitely help you with it. The SPF proves that you're allowing Motic to send emails for you, for, for example, or Gmail or G Suite is allowed to send emails from you. DKIM proves that you're the one pressing send. Um, and DMARC is the bouncer, is the bouncer that's going to look at those two pieces of identification and deciding um, based on what you decided are going to either allow the email to go in as if nothing happened. They will maybe put the email in spam or they will block it. So it's the bouncer that decides to do uh, to protect you. And BIMI, as difficult as it may seem to get in place, of course, one of the blockers now is having a um, trademark logo. Uh, but hopefully that's going to change and it's going to be easier. BIMI is authentication that if you are a good sender um, and you have BIMI implemented, people are going to see your logo in the little circle next to your email. It is great for brand awareness. Uh, there's a company, if I'm not mistaken, that's uh, helping uh, customers do this called Redshift. Uh, they will allow you to uh, get everything ready to make sure that you can go authentication all the way to BIMI. Then the other thing that is very important and sometimes scary and annoying are block lists. So block lists are independent organizations and there are two types, mainly IP-based and domain-based. So if you're using an email marketing software provider and you don't have your own IPs, your own dedicated IPs, you can start worrying about your domain base because the ESP is taking care of the IPs for you. If not, you have to be looking at both. And it's very important, even if the block lists, your IPs or your domains find themselves on are not um, impacting the mailbox providers that you do business with, for example, um, you should still listen to them because it might be a huge red flag for a German mailbox provider, but for Microsoft, it's taken into consideration. It doesn't mean that because it's taken into consideration that the red flag is not being calculated by another mailbox. It's just that different problems or have different weight between different mailbox providers. So even if you see your domain or your IP on a weird block list, Try understanding what the block list is looking for. And they're always looking for something. That is their business. So Spam House, for example, has a very popular one. The DBL, if you have any spam traps in your email from Spam House, they will put your domain um, on the DBL listing. This proves that you have to do list cleaning. Maybe you have to protect your form. Somebody abused them. You might have uploaded an old list, made a mistake. But it proves that you have spam traps in your list. It's not looking for anything else, just the spam traps. So if you clean your list and you ask for delisting, you will be removed. If you understand what each block list is looking for, you can understand where the, what the problem is. And if you see a pro problem with the block list, anybody listening to that block list or anybody who is able to monitor the same thing will decide if they still like you as a sender or not. So, you know, I might have my credit card stolen, but in the meantime, while I'm not paying it on time or I have, you know, I went over the limit, the bank is not going to be happy with me. So this is not only there just to annoy us when we're not being, you know, we're not following the rules, but it is also um, there to protect me. If somebody did abuse my forms, I would, I like the fact that Spam House caught it and I can fix the issue because imagine me sending emails to fake email addresses over time, how bad of a reputation I can create with the actual mailbox providers. So the block lists are not there to annoy us and to make our lives difficult. They're also there to protect us um, as senders. And of course, it's there to protect the consumers who are actually receiving our emails. And be on, let's all be honest, when we go in our own inboxes, I don't know for you, I'm not too happy with all the emails I get. But then when I talk to companies or I'm on the sending side, it's like, yes, let's go send more emails. Market, let's go. And we forget that we don't like stuff in our inboxes. So the block list and the spam filters are there to ensure that everyone is happy and to remind us to be a little bit more logical sometimes, you know? 
the times have changed. The inboxes don't work the same. No matter, you know, if you don't like what I'm saying or it's not what you were expecting, uh, technology has changed. So we also have to adapt. So now let's take the things that the sender reputation is looking uh, for when it's taking that like credit score and deciding who you are. Um, so the ones that are going to um, decide this are the mailbox providers. So the block lists have a historical reputation of when you were on a list and when you were delisted. The mailbox providers remember everything you've ever done, what your subscribers are doing, how many people are opening, when you're sending emails, what kind of content, is it repetitive, is it not repetitive? And you have a sender reputation with each mailbox provider. Google might love you, Hotmail might not, or vice versa. Then you have the block list. The block lists are just here and they're just red, green, red. They like you, they don't like you. Um, you can fix the issue very easily. The block list and the mailbox providers work together, as in the block lists are giving data to the mailbox providers. But the mailbox writers doesn't necessarily have to listen to the block list. They decide what they do with that information. So, for example, I had a customer who was on Spam House DBL. They had spam traps in their in their inbox, in their list. Sorry, the uh, Hotmail said, "Nope, we're going to bounce every single email. No, we don't want any of your emails until Spam House removes you from the listing." Google said, "Whatever, you have really good engagement. People love your emails. They open, they click, they reply, they send, they forward." all the emails are going to the inbox. So even though that sender didn't have the best list practices, the forms were abused for a period of time, Hotmail weren't accepting the emails, but Google was. So it's important, you need to check your lists, see who you're sending emails to, and make sure that all of those mailbox providers are happy um, and that you're always raising green flags. And then of course, marketing. Now, I don't know if who's going to be happy or not happy, the marketing part, if you remove engaging people and uh, trying to show to the mailbox that people want to read it, exclamation points, the word sale uh, is not the reason your emails are going to spam. It is not your marketer who wrote a very you know, interesting sales subject line that made the email go to spam. The, the, um, the percentage of that happening is extremely, extremely low. If the mailbox providers don't know you, it's the first time you're sending 1 million emails, then maybe content might affect you. But if you have a long relationship with the mailbox providers, they know what type of content you're sending, they know about your business, they know about your customers, and you put 10 exclamation points in your subject line, you're still going to go to the inbox if you have a good sender reputation. So the marketing team's job is to convert people, not into opening an email, because a 100% open rate without a sale, to me, is not success. Your marketing team's job is not to send more, to have more chances. Your marketing team is to understand your audience, what they want, and figure how to take your business goals and squeeze them into the valuable content you're sending to your customers. And the next step is to get them to do something. In most cases, the email, it's just an email. Hi, I'm Walmart. We sell, or I don't know, food. Yes, I want food. I'm a human. I'll eat food. But is it, did I just go grocery shopping? Did you send me five emails today? Are you sending me emails about diapers, even though I care more about, I don't know, changing the, the oil of my car? What do I want? And if you're talking about your store, give something to somebody where they're going to do something after. You don't want people to just open email. You want them to buy your product, come to your event. You want them to end up on your website and do something. So your marketer's goals is not only to get them to open email. That is not going to be enough anymore for the inboxes. We, you, the inboxes want to see that you're bringing people on a path into doing something that is valuable to the both of us, the business and the subscriber. Then your volume makes sense um, here that is going to impact your sender reputation. The mailboxes know who you are, what you do, and they want to see this be consistent. So if on Black Friday, you go from sending one email a month to 10 emails a day, they're not going to like that. You're going to have a problem. Frequency is not only on a daily basis or on a monthly basis. It's on a per person basis. Yanatori might be looking at one email a month. Don't send her 10 a day. This other person might be looking at a couple a week. Send them a different kind of amount. Of course, it can sound very, very complicated, but the easiest is starting with marketing. What is my business goals? What do you want out of your emails? 
Do you want to remind people you exist? Or do you want people to do something? Because unfortunately, all of this ties into engagement and engagement is becoming extremely crucial when it comes to email. You might have a great sender reputation and still certain personas are not going to get the email and they're not your personas. It's the mailboxes provider's personas. Like I don't have the same persona as my father who's 72 years old and barely knows how to use his inbox. He gets a lot more spam than I do. So you don't want the mailbox providers to decide just like social media does. So it's important to take the time to create some goals and to target the right people because we're all going to have some problems soon. And of course, here, the content consistency and engagement part is extremely important because this is what explains who you are. And who you are is what's going to help you land in the inbox. But you need to make sure that the little triangle works. So you got the subscriber that is getting what they want. You got the mailbox providers that is getting things it's expecting from you. And then there's you on the side trying to figure all this out and make sure that everyone is happy, not only people, but machines as well. Because unfortunately, before the people get the email, it's a machine, Tinder swiping your emails into the inbox or into the spam folder or Nora at all. So it's extremely important that um, if your business pivots, to take the time to um, let the spam filters know you're doing this. So if you want to send from one email a month to 10 a day, do it gradually. If you're ready for Black Friday, we're starting now. Now is the time to prepare for Black Friday. And you can put the volume up. You can get certain engagement because selling just to sell uh, 55 discount coupons a week, at some point you, you're lowering the value of your, of your product and uh, your business. So it's important to do things very slowly. If you're going to pivot um, uh, who you're communicating with, how you're doing it, the, con the content, the consistency, the, the length of your emails, the amount of call to actions, the tone of your voice. Uh, during Corona, high-end brands had some deliverability issues because they went from buy my $10 million purse to, oh, we love you and we care and it's something we can do for you. And that didn't make sense to the mailbox providers. They had this historical data that said, this is, you know, push, push, expensive product. And it went to, we're here to help you. Um, they had deliverability problems because of content. People need to make changes slowly so that the machine can learn along with you and your subscribers. Um, and the last question, and this is very interesting. A lot of people ask me, okay, great. You just gave me a list of things I'm not allowed to do. Now what? Um, one of the interesting things uh, to see if you're doing everything okay is seed listing. It is very easy. I'm going to assume a lot of people have done it already. It's an inboxing test. So what you do is that the tool is going to give you a list of email addresses that they take care of. You send your email normally to them, um, to that list, and um, the tool is going to let you know which emails landed where. So you can see in this example that the customer has really good, everything's okay with Hotmail and Gmail um, and Mail.ru, but Yahoo and uh, iCloud didn't accept their emails. So here we can see what we need to fix. We're, we need to go look at IPs. We need to go look at spam reports. Um, those are the biggest red flags. And then we can continue from there. So understanding which mailbox writers love you or love you a little bit less will allow you to see what are the issues. And if you don't know what issues, uh, what it means, if Google doesn't like you or Hotmail doesn't like you, uh, always feel free to connect with me. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I love talking about email and deliverability, and I can do it forever. So if you guys have any questions about what the results of your seed listing test do, let me know. I will definitely help you there. Um, most of this information is uh, free information. It's just um, knowing what to look for sometimes is the issue when it comes to deliverability with an email. Uh, so if you have any kinds of questions, uh, find the nearest email geek and ask them a bunch of questions, me included. So um, thank you, everybody. I right in time. Um, so uh, please feel free. I love talking about email. I have I have something to tell, but when I talk about email, I have nothing to sell. Um, I love hearing uh, different situations that people have. So any problems you have, connect with me. Uh, I'm very easy to, to connect with. I have a very weird name. Uh, so you can, I write a lot and I talk a lot about this. And um, if you ever need any help authenticating your domain, um, please join uh, Let's Authenticate the World. It's a free uh, service that I offer. I'm not looking for anything in exchange, just trying to make the internet a, a safer place. And a cute little picture of Luna when she was a baby. It's 
I think one of the cutest. <laughs> she has too much energy now. <laughs> and that's it. So I am going to stop sharing my screen, see if there's any um, questions or uh, chats. Oh, I see here. Laws for sure. I don't know. What I, I know I was talking about laws, but I don't know what. <laughs> the laws are important to follow. Um, and one great tip, actually, that uh, this reminds me is that technology and what people want kind of create laws and the laws kind of create as well how technology works. If you understand what the laws want, you can understand how the spam filters want to. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Wow, <laughs> this was a bunch of things. Yeah, and, it's uh, important. It's so much to talk about. Yeah. Uh, so many things impact you. Yeah, it's, it's uh, always feels like a niche. And this yes. Is so important of a niche and so many things to, to understand and digest and so on. Of um, yeah. And I do agree that, that laws is one of the foundations. And the problem is, of course, when you deal with multiple regions, with multiple laws, that uh, increases okay. the fun level. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it can be, it was quite stressful. I remember when uh, Can't Spam and Castle came out and then GDPR and everyone was panicking. Oh no, email is going to die. Mm -hmm. No, nothing changed. It was just more about enforcing the respect that businesses need to have towards their customers. You know, um, we all know that we get too many emails in their inbox and there's so many that we just accumulate over time and they're trying to minimize that. Uh, make people happier. We don't get to complain and also do the same thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think ethically is definitely the right thing. Uh, yeah. Also, the, the general wisdom is um, that if people don't want that email, uh, it's not going to work anyway. Uh, on the other end, there are people who say, well, there's always a certain percentage. So yeah. the more I send, the better it is. Even if it's unethical, okay, that's... Your yeah, thing. yeah. And yeah. you know, what's the one uh, thing that's also a problem? People assume that the mailbox providers tell you who reported your email as spam. Not all mailbox providers uh, do this. Uh, Google will tell you a percentage of the emails Google received that um, said uh, report as spam, but you don't know who. So they reported your email as spam. So now the emails are going to spam and you're continuing because you don't know this. It is very freaky. A lot of people are like, oh, my spam complaints are so low. I don't know what the problem is. No, 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 they're not low. You just don't know about them. And if they don't give the information, nobody, like, no ESP can give it. Uh, it's, um, it, that uh, it usually is an eye opener. What? But I have a spam rate. Yes, because some mailboxes give the information, but a lot of them don't. Uh, the best place to see the list is on the MOG website, uh, M3 AWG. And you write feedback loops. They have a list of the mailboxes, who gives the spam reports and what kind of information they give. Most of them, like Google, which is usually the biggest part of our list, doesn't tell you who. That's, uh, that's scary. <laughs> you don't know who's complaining to okay. Google that they don't like you. It's very, very bad. List cleaning is very important. Every, everything starts from the list, I think. You authenticate your domain, and then you look at your list all the time. It's, so it's uh, M3AAWG? Yes. Work? Okay. Oh uh, yes, I have, I have the. If I just write the spam in my, <laughs> I sent it to so many people over time. I can put it in the chat here. Uh, yeah, I just pasted it there. Ah uh, yes, the here and here's the direct link of yeah. how spam reports are created. It's very simple, very short. It is the most important thing to understand how it works. Um, understanding how your email marketing statistics work is super important. Uh, how open rates work because that will make you play the game correctly. You know, you can play Monopoly or you can play Monopoly and know all the rules. Who's going to win? You know, I'm going to throw the dice and the other person's going to steal my money. Uh, so it's very important because the moment you understand, immediately you're in the right mindset and the decisions you make are not going to impact your deliverability because you're going to know how to play the game. <laughs> okay, let's move on to Ted who says, can you ah. say more about engagement? Is it the most opens and clicks or what is it? Okay, so... Um, in 2017, there was a graph from Verizon, I think, that was showing that the open rates at ESPC on average is 30% of, um, the reality is 30% of what the ESPs are saying. So if you thought you're 30% open rates, 10% was the real that they were calculating inside the inbox. 
Opens have never been the most uh, reliable metric. Apple did not change. They just announced something to, to the people. Um, so when it comes to engagement within the inbox, what people want is, um, the inboxes, sorry, want, is not only the opens and clicks, is the amount of time that the email is open. Whatever you would assume for social media, start assuming it for email. So are people, you know, opening the video and watching it a second? Or are they opening a video and then watching most of it? Uh, same thing with the emails. They can tell if your your subject lines are clickbaity. You open an email and you, oh, and you leave, they can tell. So, of course, we want the open, but the best thing is to get people to do something else. So take the time to scroll slowly, not the up and down scroll. We want people to star uh, the email. Uh, you can ask people to move the email from specific places, even from the spam to the inbox or from promotions to inbox, inbox promotions, whatever. But the best type of engagement is replying back to the email. We forget email is a two-way street. There is nothing that shouts... I want this email, then a marketing campaign being replied to um, without it being angry, like, Liv, get me off the list. Um, so a reply would be one of the best forms of engagement. Uh, but we want people to come back to email. So sometimes that's why QR codes or barcodes are inside the email so that people open it. Remember, they, want to, they, they need the coupon. And then when they go to the store, they go look for an email, open the email, and then Google's like, wow. They opened it twice and for a long time. Valuable. Um, so anything that is going to be positive, the amount of time, uh, if people are clicking, especially Google, Google knows what's happening in the email and what's happening after. Uh, so seeing people engage further than the email. And the last thing is ratios. If a big amount of people are not doing uh, or ignoring you, just pretending you don't exist, it's going to impact you more than sending to less people that are engaging and then maybe one or two people complain. So it's all about the ratios, which is why buying lists can be a problem. You're accumulating people on your list, but only the first few times is when people are going to interact. So your list is growing, but your engagement is constant. Ratios are extremely important for mailboxes. And it's on a mailbox provider and not on a whole. Google doesn't know what's happening at Hotmail and so on. So it's one by one. So that's the most important part about the uh, engagement. Okay, it's, cool. uh, it, it's fun. <laughs> uh, um, I have another question, and maybe a tiny one. You did talk about the importance of RBL lists or of uh, blacklists yes. in, in general, and how easy it is to come to get there. Um, so, what do I do if I'm on one of those lists? I know this. 20 or so, but... but ah, uh, I know, it's everybody always panics. Uh, there are certain block lists that you should panic or it's um, or maybe have a bigger you know, network of people listening to them. Um, step number one is not to get angry at the block list. They're looking for certain things and they found it. Uh, they found that you're doing it. So it's extremely important to... Um, Understand, like spam house doesn't have one block list. They have several because they're looking for several different things. So it's one, monitoring it. Uh, you can have DNSB. There's a lot of DNSBL monitoring tools out there, including mine. And uh, you put your domain or your IP, and we're constantly checking. What happens when a domain is listed is you go to the website, and you can literally Google the name of the block list, especially those three capital letters to tell you which one it is. And it's going to tell you. Very high spam complaint rates is going to tell you high spam traps or your your um, sorry your <laughs> your mailbox is not configured correctly your sender email is not configured correctly you're missing an RDNS or it's not secure or uh, we feel that um, your system has been abused by you or somebody else so you know what the problem is and then. If you know, if you can figure it out and uh, find the problem, fix it before even contacting them. This will make the process a lot easier. You tell them, sorry, we made a mistake. Or you tell them um, uh, what you fix. We didn't know this. We fix it. Uh, somebody uploaded a list by mistake. Whatever you, 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 what happened. You tell them exactly what you did. We did this thing, this thing. We're not going to happen again. Thank you very much. Very polite. You don't go yelling at a tax lawyer or at the bank. You polite and um if ever you're missing information let them know hey i understand this i don't see an issue because sometimes it's not you it is you are you, your domain are being abused or your infrastructure and you can ask them 
if you're polite and you, you look honest, they're going to reply back. Um, if the answer is too obvious, they might not. And they're going mm. to stay radio silent and send you an automated message saying, you have high spam complaints, figure it out. Um, can you list your things? And that's it. They all have a, um, a form that you can um, write. One issue sometimes for some people is that you require a postmaster tool, like a postmaster inbox, because they need a confirmation that you're the person that has access to the domain. Um, so with m most mailbox providers, if you have postmaster at your domain dot com, um, that domain is usually a group or is free for you to use and should be created anyway. So that if anybody uh, wants to report abuse or has any issue, they can email you there. The block list also will confirm you're the owner by having that inbox sometimes. So those are the two things. Be polite, mm -hmm. honest, and fix the issue. It's a machine looking for things. So even if you yell very loudly, if the machine is, it finds it, they cannot remove you. Um, mm -hmm. And it's independent organization. So Okay, okay cool. <laughs> Hello, that brings me to, to a last really brief question and uh, with a request for a brief answer because we are running out of time already. Of course, yes. Um, and that is what are your top tools for uh, deliverability status? Ah, oh, perfect. So um, the, um, the, the, the first one is the easiest one. It is Google Postmaster. Uh, it is free. It is the Equifax that Google provides uh, to senders that tells them if they like you or they don't. Uh, they offer four colors that are very difficult to understand. Green, yellow, red, and burgundy. Uh, you want to have green IPs and uh, green reputation. And they also give you, based on the emails they receive from you, Gmail from Gmail to Gmail, um, they're going to tell you how many emails they have received, the percentage of spam complaints. Um, they're going to tell you which campaigns as well sometimes um, the issues came from, and they will let you know as well if you're authenticated and if there was any delivery issues. So like, for example, last year when Google was down for a whole day, well, there was a ton of delivery issues. Zero. Usually everything is 100. And the other one would be SNDS. But of course, you will need dedicated IPs uh, for that. Um, okay. SNDS uh, okay. shows you data based on your IP instead of the domain. Okay. Google good. Right now. Oh. SNDS. Oh my god! It's in my Microsoft thing, or thing. Or? Yes, yes, yes. And the website okay. looks like it's if if the website looks like it was done in 1993, it's the right website. <laughs> oh, it is a Microsoft thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Okay, uh, yeah, I, I share that in the chat, uh, of chat course, as well. Let me do that. Uh, and this one, right? Uh, chat here. Yes. Lovely. <laughs> <The beautiful website. laughs> and if not, uh, postmaster.google.com. So uh, with Email Console, we have an integration with all of them so that you can have one place to look at your reputation all across the board. Uh, but yeah, the, it's, it's not a phishing website. It's the real website um, of Microsoft. Uh, so okay. if you want a nicer dashboard, you can come to my tool. You can see the data and not have a heart attack every time you look at the website. Um, <laughs> but it's definitely important because they tell you, we like you or we don't. Um, okay. Can't argue with that. So you cannot shoot the messenger. I'm just here to help <laughs> mitigate <laughs> your issues. I'm just repeating what they want. <laughs> okay. It's important to understand. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm sure the audience is appreciating, it, appreciating that as much as I am. And um, I can tell you I'm going to give this recording to a couple of colleagues over here. And, uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, yeah, well, anybody can just uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, anybody who's ever met me, they say, yeah, she just talks and just doesn't yeah. stop. So yeah, a lot of things okay. to learn. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for your time and for the generous insights. Um, I hope Thank to you see you time. soon somewhere in the modic space. Of course. And uh, until then, take care. Have a good time. And, <laughs> Have yeah, a good thank one, you very guys. much. <laughs> bye. Thanks, Diana. Bye bye.